It's my great pleasure to introduce the esteemed Dr. Ethan Danahay, yeah. who many of you know is uh, from Dr. E's challenges. So Ethan, if we're all co-located, I know you'd get a rousing applause, applause as I um, hand over <laughs> to you, but given we're on Zoom, I'm hoping that a little spike prime applause will suffice. So <laughs> on behalf of everybody, we can see cheers going on, or perhaps even a more Lego-based applause, which would be <laughs> there you go, for those who are familiar. So Ethan, I'll hand over to you. So I'll just uh, stop sharing. I'm, I'm glad you started this with goofiness so that uh, I know where the bar is uh, <laughs> Good. to move ahead on. Uh, excellent. Well, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Okay. Uh, in terms of questions, I'm going to share my screen here to get us going. <clears throat> in terms of questions, uh, uh, James, will you help uh, uh, just monitor the chat if people throw it in there and then interrupt me just because I might not see it pop up, pop up on screen or, or anything like that. But uh, um, but also just thank you to, uh, to James and MTA in general, and of course, all of you for coming and attending and giving us this opportunity to, to share with you. There's, there's a couple things that are sort of happening here simultaneously. One is I know that you're interested as, as teachers to understand the Spike Prime platform better, as well as to sort of see like, where can we push this uh, into the future. And second, we're interested in that exact same thing. So all of what we're gonna be doing is pretty cutting edge in terms of us uh, here at Tufts University exploring these ideas. Uh, I know MTA has been pushing um, the envelope a lot with uh, Spike Prime, seeing how it can move from sort of middle school to high school or, or primary to secondary. Uh, and and so it's a it's a bit of a journey that we're all on together. So you know, again, as I'm looking for your feedback too about uh, what's working, what's not working, questions that you have, um, and and even this format is sort of experimental for us as well, right? So here I'm up here in Boston, Massachusetts. It's uh, it's uh, evening here, Monday evening. I know it's Tuesday morning down there. So you know, how do we even run a an effective online? zoom based spike prime workshop for teachers so there's a, a little bit of experimentation all over and so we're definitely looking for your feedback wondering what you're hoping to get out of this hopefully we'll hit on some of those topics but anything that we miss by all means let's uh let's keep that communication channel open so you can send your questions uh after the fact to, to james as well as to uh and he can certainly get answers from me and, and send them along the other thing is that we're we're going to try to fit a lot in because we're trying to see what works and, and what doesn't. So uh, what I've tried to do is put all of this information on a uh, workshop website. And, and James, just in case people are uh, joining a bit late and don't see the chat history, if you can throw that bit.ly URL again in the chat, that will we'll help people see a web page where one, you can get all of the slides that I'm going to show as a, as a PDF, but also all the things we're talking about are now there in a static format for you to go back, revisit, digest again, um, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully that sort of sets the stage as to what we're doing and what we're after and what we're, what we're trying to explore. And with that, I think we should uh, so sort of jump, jump right in. Um, and as you can see, the topic is talking about machine learning. So machine learning itself is a sort of brand new pushing the envelope type uh, a, a field that is complex it's it's hard it's it's uh, there's a lot of um, misunderstandings there's a lot of power behind it uh, the world is going to be running on machine learning uh, soon enough and so it's also a great topic to start to bring into our classroom start to explore as teachers to have our students start to understand and, and of course we're, we're huge fans of the uh, spike platform and it gives an opportunity to make some of these conceptual ideas uh, tangible and, and hands-on so uh, here's a brief agenda of the types of things that we're going to do. First, I want to introduce myself to you. So in case you don't know who I am or some of the things that I've done with Lego, uh, especially as I teach with uh, the Spike Prime myself, hopefully that will be in some inspiration to you. Going to give a high level introduction to machine learning. And we're going to talk briefly about supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. And as we believe strongly in hands on project based learning, we're going to try to do some some of that hands on uh, activities with you and, and uh, get you using the spike prime to engage in some of these ideas and uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes and then at the end you know this field is huge and so there's lots of other directions that ideas we had for the workshop that we couldn't fit in the two hours other directions to go and explore 
Uh, and so I've captured those as well so that there's um, plenty of directions for you to, after the fact, digest and, and go off and, and experiment and play. So uh, I'm here. Uh, my name is Ethan Danahy. I go by this Dr. E. There's my Dr. E's uh, lab LED sign behind me. Uh, and I'm here at the Tufts School of Engineering, and, and I do research within a group called the Center for Engineering Education and Outreach. And actually on the call as well is one of our doctoral students, Milan. He's, uh, he's a researcher in mechanical engineering. He's been doing a lot of machine learning, uh, working on a, um, his thesis is around this concept of smart motors. So where do we embed the intelligence actually in a motor itself? Uh, and then he's here, he helped me <laughs> develop some of this material for today and then is also here to support us as, as we're sort of going along. So thanks Milan for joining. Um, and uh, so I'm a research professor at Tufts University. My background is computer science and electrical engineering. And I've been teaching here for over a decade now. Uh, I focus mostly on the intro to engineering sequence. So our 18, 19 year olds who come to university out of high school, out of secondary. Uh, and I think about how to transition them into engineering. And I know a lot of you are, are secondary teachers yourselves. So we, we teach very similar students, just uh, uh, sort of adjacent to each other. <clears throat> and the research that we do here at the Center for Engineering Education and Outreach is uh, we, we develop new tools, we uh, develop curriculum, we do education research, and we do a lot of outreach as well. And really this idea of, of we believe all students from really little kids, kindergarten, all the way up through university should be uh, engaging in engineering education. There's a lot of benefits that can sort of come from that, no matter which discipline you end up going in, having the ideas of iteration and, and recovering from failure about creativity and um, collaboration, all the things that engineering projects bring to the classroom. Those are all really important skills that, that we need out, out in the world. And then the other thing I'll do is just a quick plug for our, uh, we call it TEEP, teacher engineering education program. So we offer online courses uh, for how to teach engineering education, how to use these tools and technologies. And we actually have a, a track that um, is specific for secondary education. It uses the Spike Prime, it gets into uh, programming with Python on the Spike Prime, et cetera. So that might be of interest to uh, teachers on this call that are, that are newer to this and, and wondering how do I um, bring uh, engineering education into my classroom. There's some of the courses are, are technology based and the logistics of how to do it. And some of them are more pedagogy based and how to uh, have good classroom discussions and, and things like that. So there's my plug. Uh, as I said, I'm an I'm a instructor here at, at Tufts. I've taught an intro to engineering robotics course for many years. I started with the NXT, then switched to the EV3 when that came out. And now I've been teaching with the Spike Prime for, for several years. There's a picture of me top left uh, pre-pandemic. And then, of course, middle of pandemic when we were able to go back in person. And uh, uh, well, I went back to teaching in person, but clearly I didn't go get a haircut in person until, uh, until a full year into the pandemic. Um, uh, again, yeah, te teaching with Spike Prime, it was hard. It was really hard that first uh, school year back where we all had to do six foot distancing. Uh, we had to wear masks. Uh, suddenly all the things that I value like collaboration and uh, some of the debugging strategies, none of that was able to uh, be implemented because I couldn't physically go up to my students who were working on their robots. I couldn't help them at their computer uh, type on their keyboards. Um, fortunately, now we're still wearing masks here at Tufts, but we're not, we don't have the social distancing requirements, so we're able to sort of all be in the same room, we're able to um, do group projects and things like that. I like to show this picture, uh, because this might feel familiar to some of you, even though I'm at this university that has all kinds of resources, sometimes I still get assigned a bad room. So there we are, we have to push those chairs aside, you know, if I don't get a room with the tables, uh, we're just on the floor. Um, working on on our uh, Spike Prime projects. Other times I do get the good room, so that's that's uh, that's fortunate. But again, I just you know I, I'll paint a rosy picture, but you know sometimes the logistics of being a teacher uh, happen no matter where you are or what what you're sort of engaging in. I want to highlight some of the projects that I do at university using the Spike Prime to to do an introduction to engineering. Uh, I like to start the class right off with a uh, getting to know you uh, activity where here the students are expressing their uh, creativity, uh, personalization, I believe very strongly in each student developing a sort of unique solution that's particular to them as opposed to just implementing my ideas. Uh, and so also what I find is that students are 
maybe familiar with Lego, but unfamiliar with the Technic building system. So this activity allows a sort of introduction to the, the pegs and the connectors and the grid system. Um, I actually don't use any motors or hub during that first intro. A few weeks later, I might be now uh, getting into the robotic side where they're exploring motors and sensors potentially. I do a biomimicry project where they each student picks an animal, researches it, uh, and then tries to mimic it using the, the robotics platform. Again, this is great for that idea of sharing amongst the class where everyone's seeing what each other are doing, trying to learn from each other, be inspired from each other, um, start to say, wait, how did you do that? And asking each other questions, which really starts to raise that barrier to peer learning and uh, uh, learning from each other. Later on in the semester, I like to focus on client based engineering. So really thinking about who is your client? Who is it that you're solving the engineering problem for? One of the first projects we do there is one I've called astronaut tools, where I'm using the concept of a, of a spacewalk and EVA extravehicular activity. Um, and so I hand out these little test setups of just basically a couple bolts with some nuts on them. But the challenge is to build an astronaut tool that can move a nut from one bolt to another. However, you have to wear these big bulky winter gloves. You can only use it one handed. It has to be operatable right hand or left hand, which is actually a, a requirement from NASA Space Agency about the tools that that astronauts are uh, bring up into space because they have to be able to hold on with one hand. So everything has to be operational one handed. Uh, and then uh, I have yet to figure out how to test it in quote unquote zero G's. So I just make them uh, do it uh, right side up, sideways and upside down. And I figure if they can do it those three directions and not drop the nut uh, that they're doing that they're doing pretty well uh, in terms of uh, operating in zero G's. If anyone has access to one of those uh, one of those airplanes that goes up and down, right? That like simulates weightlessness. I'm I'm uh, I'll be there in a second to try some of these projects out. A couple other ones that that uh, we've done towards the end of October here is is Halloween, of course, we'd put on a big haunted house. I love that again, because you're thinking about the client thinking about uh, who's who's in your uh, uh, coming to see the work that you're doing coming to see your projects, uh, make it big interactive. Also, this idea of, of having like a showcase and um, sort of the marketing and, and promotion of the class that I'm teaching. So I get people on campus really excited about the work that we're doing, uh, build build awareness and, and um, enthusiasm around the class and the projects. And of course, the students love that pressure of showcasing their work for, for, for others outside. And then the, the final project uh, that I did this past semester was called Playful Creations, where they actually had a client and they had to design a new robotic interface to do something fun, right? And so at the bottom, you see a shuffleboard. The, and, the tricky thing this year, though, of course, was because of COVID, I couldn't bring in actual clients into the classroom. So I had them really pushing the envelope where my students were building web based interfaces. Uh, and so up here in the top right, I'm going to show you an example of one of the interfaces that a student built where you could select drop downs and select colors and select amounts of color. And then you would actually hit submit that would go up uh, through the Internet, be stored in the cloud, would be pulled down. And then we'd actually control the spike prime that was then connected to these uh, sort of paint canisters. And so the person selected this amount of red and it would open up the red tube and drop some red down. And then they'd say this amount of blue and it would open up the blue thing and drop some blue down. Uh, and so, again, like fun, playful, interactive, creative. Uh, pushing the envelope, thinking about interfaces, thinking about collaboration. And of course, when you're splattering paint all over, the student engagement is right through through the roof um, um, as we're as we're sort of sort of going on there. So um, I often get again, one, I could also fill the two hours just talking about my class, but I know we have other things to get onto, but I want to just sort of inspire you and, and make you think about all the different ways that uh, Lego or Spike Prime or robotics, these types of projects could be brought into your classroom. I'm often asked about how I design my uh, semester. And what you can see here is across the, the x-axis is time, right? So projects one through 10. Uh, and then you can see how I sort of have designed it. This is you know behind the scenes of how do I think about my, my projects where I'm sort of adding a little bit more each and every project so that the students are doing something more and more complex. At the beginning, it's just building. Then we add motors and gears and programming and uh, having deadlines and interaction with the world and thinking about clients and sensors and loops and programming and and it just sort of gets more and more 
um, uh, sophisticated as the semester goes on. So I'm able to sort of lead students along that where each week where I'm pushing them out just outside their comfort zone, but each week they sort of are able to achieve that and then find out next week I've pushed it a little bit further um, as we're going along. I have actually yet to bring some of this concepts of AI and machine learning into my class, but I'm excited uh, now that we're having these types of conversations and thinking about this to actually now uh, do more of that. I know Chris Rogers, who some of you may know as well, uh, has done that in his upper level robotics course. And, and again, in the sort of uh, next steps, future work, I've put some links to some of his projects too that you can um, sort of explore. All right, so uh, let's see, James, I'll ask any, any uh, questions, comments that I should be pausing uh, before I uh, uh, start moving on. Oh, what do I see here? How many minutes per week? Uh, of course, I'm at university, so the students live in dorms and they're able to work together and, and uh, um, do things like that. So I see the students face to face for about uh, uh, two, three, two, three, almost three hours, uh, but then they're putting in another seven or eight hours a week outside of class. So I, I and I pack it full and I push them and and uh, I'm very fortunate to have some of the some of the top students here here at Tufts. Uh, and then issues with students keeping up. The, the other piece is with with these projects. Let's see, do I still have my my uh, there we go. The other piece with this project is because they're open ended and because there's a sort of student defined deliverable, they're able to scope and scale the project to sort of fit wherever they are. So if they are because I get students that come in that have done first robotics that have uh, taken AP computer science, right, that are that are way ahead of the curve, but I still want to challenge them. And so what I see in those is I can quickly I'd first identify those students and then two i'm always encouraging them to push the envelope and go further and further and further okay you did x but could you also do y and z on top of that on the other hand i also have students that come in without any background have never done lego robotics have never done any programming haven't haven't touched any of these platforms before but all of these projects are still sort of accessible at a bare minimum in that and so there's ways to sort of deliver working prototypes that are um, still at a, at a sort of base level. So in that way, I'm allowed, I'm able to sort of um, keep everyone going along that pathway at whatever sort of individualized sort of learning plan that they're working on at that. All right. I think I caught a couple of those. All right. Yeah, that seems to be most of the questions. Excellent. So now we're gonna get into the uh, meat of the, uh, of the system. So I wanna just sort of talk a little bit about artificial intelligence or specifically sort of talking about machine learning. And, and first I'll phrase it in the way that I've been sort of thinking about this. So one is we're starting to see AI and machine learning in sort of every facet of our lives. And the first thing is we're all gonna be interacting with these systems. So I think that this is an important topic for us to sort of have discussions in our classrooms, to be aware of, to talk about the ethics and the implications of these systems, because no matter what you do, you're going to be interacting with these systems, right? So you may be using Siri on your phone. That's a AI machine learning system. Uh, even if you park your car in a parking lot, they may now be doing uh, ticketing based on a uh, image processing computer vision system that, that's using machine learning. So uh, whether you like it or not, you're going to be interacting with these types of systems. And so understanding the, the what these systems are capable of, what they are not capable of, how powerful they are, when should we be worried, um, et cetera, I think are, are very valid sort of pieces of it. The second thing is I think more and more we're going to find that we're actually the ones in charge of training these systems, right? So we both, you know, somebody else may build the system, but we end up training it and then interacting with it. So again, you may, you're not sort of thinking of it as like, oh, I'm training the system. But when you use Facebook or social media, of course, you're training their system. So somebody else built it, but every click that you do is being recorded and they're making future decisions based on that past data. Um, when you do one of those, I am not a robot type things, yes, you are one, verifying you're not a robot, but two, you're also helping the, train the system. So they're using that click data from you to feed back into the system to do uh, image recognition, to uh, improve things like Google image search. When you say, I wanna see a picture of a tree, and it finds a picture of a tree, humans actually helped train those systems uh, through, through uh, systems like this. So again, that's something that where we're starting to be sort of part of it. And I think what we're going to find as we go 
into the future is that more and more people are going to be also responsible for sort of creating these systems. Whether or not they're sort of computer scientists operating at the lowest level, they're still going to be sort of designing and in charge of these because we're going to start to see AI and machine learning seeping into almost any and every industry that we sort of work in. So from social media to transportation to finance to healthcare to e-commerce to et cetera, et cetera. Either this is an image I found off the internet, but but all of these disciplines are going to involve AI and machine learning and more and more as as we and our students, especially our students in 10, 15, 20 years, as they're out in the world, they're going to also be required to uh, sort of create, train and interact with the systems. So therefore, I think this is a and this is my argument for why this is such an important topic to bring in to understand what the cap what the capabilities are, where the limitations are, when are they appropriate, when are they not appropriate? Um, because this is going to be the power that sort of drives um, uh, the future, future, the future. There we go, um, type of thing. What I'm gonna, what we're gonna do today is a lot in the middle. We're gonna try to actually train some of our own systems, and then I tried to make all of the code as accessible as possible because I know we have folks on here who who have Python background and. Um, uh, and so that you could also go in and actually tweak the systems, actually maybe not create them from scratch, but you can modify them, uh, alter them and play with some of those parameters as well. So we'll, we'll spend some time in the middle and then hopefully also um, do a little bit there on the, on the right if, if, if you so wish. So machine learning specifically is a, is a subset of artificial intelligence. Here it's where uh, it, it, the machine is learning from the past in without programming it explicitly. So if you've done line followers with Spike Prime before, you know you usually, you the programmer pick a threshold, you the programmer say, if it's less than do this, if it's greater than do this. Um, here, what we're gonna do is use machine learning where that is actually going to be making those decisions as to what do I do, when do I do it, and how, how do I do it? So we teach the machines with previous data. So we would show it examples of what the line looks like, examples of what the floor looks like, tell it what we want it to do in particular situations, but then it's up to the robot itself in order to uh, perform those tasks. And what's important is that machine learning often has this limited scope in that we train it to do one thing and then it maybe is hopefully very good at doing that one thing, but it's not great at generalizing that yet. Um, and so again, those are the conversations that I would employ you to have with your students so that we don't view it as a magic wand that is able to solve all of our problems, but actually start to understand when is it useful, when is it not useful. Uh, in the field of machine learning, there's three main types. There's supervised learning, which we will start with. I'll touch on unsupervised learning, although we won't do an example there. And then hopefully we'll get to being uh, doing our, an example around reinforcement learning, a sort of third sort of method of, of training and building these systems. <clears throat> so, uh, da, 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 da. all right. So the supervised and unsupervised learning. So supervised learning is when you have a labeled data set. That is your data, right? So everything's about data. We feed a bunch of data into a system. In this case, when it's labeled, meaning that I know what my data is. It's not, uh, I know exactly what it, what it means. The classic example is um, uh, 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 in medical data, if somebody, uh, I, have a da I have a bunch of patients, half of them have a disease, half of them do not have a disease. That is labeled data because I know the answer. Uh, ones or zeros, yes or no, true or false on, on who it is. And what I do is I classify that data and, and then I can use it to predict future outcomes accurately. So now a new patient comes in and I basically ask, who is that patient most like in my initial data set? And if they're like somebody with, with a disease, then I'm going to predict that they have it. If they're like somebody without a disease, I predict that they don't. And, um, and nearest neighbor is a uh, sort of cl uh, classic classification um, uh, system for that, as opposed to unsupervised learning where the data is unlabeled and I don't know what it means. And the and an algorithm like k-means clustering, which is a, an unsupervised learning algorithm, is very good at going out and finding those groups and grouping them together. But the computer doesn't know what that group means. It says, I know that these people are similar, but I don't know why they're similar. It's still up to a human to go in and label that data, uh, label that group. And so what you can hear, in, in, as I described this, is in both cases, there's a human in the loop, right? The human is doing some sort of um, work where either in the first one, they're pre-labeling the data, or in the second one, they're labeling the sort of groups. And what I like to do when I'm having conversations about these types of topics with students is, is to highlight that 
fact that humans are in that loop and what does that imply in terms of the um uh, when a human is part of it the human's own biases are incorporated in or the human's own belief system or opinions or the fallacy of us as humans gets incorporated into these algorithms so the algorithm just chugs along and, and does whatever it's told but the fact that there's human intervention means that there is biases sort of naturally incorporated into that as well so we talk a lot about this sort of socio-technical divide where where the technical part is the computer that chugs and runs the code but there's this socio the human aspect of it that's also incorporated in there so here's uh so again i'm going to start with the supervised classification when i have uh, labeled data sets, and I want to uh, determine some new future data point, some new future information. And so the example I'm going to give is uh, somebody walks in and, and we want to know, is this person tall or short? Well, I have no label on my Y axis, so it's really hard to even tell. Is this person tall or short? I don't know. It's just a person. I have this one data point. But what? let's assume, though, that I have a collection of training data. So this is my labeled data that has come in previously. And all of this labeled data, all of this previous data, someone has gone through and labeled it. It's given a category to all this previous data. Uh, the first person is tall, the second person is short, the third person is short, the fourth person is tall, the fifth person is short. So now I have all the training data that I pass into my uh, machine learning algorithm. And so all of that labeled data can now help us understand any new future data that comes in. So in comes our test subject, our new future piece of data. And the question now is, based on this height of this new person, are they tall or are they short? And so what we're going to use is, a, is a, uh, as you can see at the top of the screen, uh, an algorithm called nearest neighbor. And this simply goes, well, let's look at all of the heights of every single person in our data set and ask, who is the closest? What's the nearest neighbor to my current value? And so what I can see here is that the closest person is um, also has been labeled as short. And so therefore, I'm going to give this new uh, person a label of short. And so any new data that comes in, I can look at all of my previous history, see which one it's closest to and say, yep, that now I can apply a label that I didn't know whether this person was tall or short. Now I can apply a label that um, that 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 applies to this new person that that came in. So. In essence, that's the whole thing. <laughs> like, again, complex terms, uh, complex names of algorithms seemingly, um, uh, but really it's just iterate through all the previous training data that's been labeled, figure out which one is the, uh, is the, is the, is the relationship. So what I wanna do is actually to try this out with, uh, right here with us today. So uh, hopefully you have uh, uh, a spike prompt. First, I hope you have a spike prime. Second, I hope that you've uh, been able to build the uh, little MTA bot that uh, that uh, James sent out some prior instructions. And my goal here is that you actually can do this activity without even uh, modifying this robot. You can see I'm not using it as a car. I'm sort of putting it on its side, um, but, but uh, we can do that. So I've attached the distance sensor to port E and the color sensor to port F. Um, you can also use with our code the force sensor if you, if you have one around. I don't have one right here. Um, and you can customize the port values if, if, you, if you got the, the right or wrong ones. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the hubs right button. So the button here on the, I guess it's hard to tell with the, uh, with the light here, but uh, the, but the right button next to the center button on our, uh, on our hub to train our robot to understand sensor motor position uh, pairs. And so uh, given a, a sensor value, given a motor position, it's going to train our robot. And then we can test it by using this left button to make predictions on the new data. So I'm going to actually get out of this here. Uh, I'm going to bump over to our uh, the website that hopefully you have a link to, because if I scroll down and go to the supervised learning uh, section of the code, I actually have an LLSP which file, which is the um, spike prime uh python code file type that you can download and open within your spike app uh that has the code the other option is i put the i embedded the code here in the page so if you just want to come down select it and control c you should be able to control v it into your um, spike app as well and uh i'm going to stop sharing for one second because i want to highlight and i think i can even switch my 
uh, camera here. Let's see. All right, there. Are we looking at my desktop now? All right. Perfect. All right, good. So uh, here I have my hub. Uh, and I think I've done this right. We shall find out. I've downloaded the program uh, that I was just showing down into uh into slot one so i'm going to run that program right now and what it's doing is asking for training data specifically give me a uh, uh ultrasonic sensor a distance sensor value and give me an associated uh motor value uh to, to match that and every time i hit the right button on my spike prime it's going to enter a new value into the uh into the training set so i'm going to put the motor there put my hand nice and close and add some training data. So every time I click this button, it's adding the data. It's measuring the distance, recording what that motor position is, which means then I can choose another distance. So now I'm going further, whoops, further away. I'm gonna set this to be a different motor position, add some more training data. And now I have a set of training data close and a set of training data further. And now I can start to make predictions. And I actually wrote a little, uh, it's hard to see, but I wrote a, the letter P on the hub to indicate predictions. And so what happens is when my hand is close, it's going to say what distance is closest to this and look up the motor position that's related to that and which one's further away and look up that position. And so now what I've done is sort of, you know, in your concept of a sort of like a line follower, um, if it sees condition one, go to this motor position. If it sees condition two, go to that motor position. So it can sort of go back and forth in uh, in this way. On the um, website, I have a, a little video where I took that exact same concept. I added a piece of paper and this piece of paper just says short or tall. Uh, and I can do the exact example that I talked about. Train a whole bunch of uh, short examples, train a whole bunch of tall examples, and then use this algorithm to, um, to actually sort of figure out what is short and what is tall. All right. So I went super fast through all of that. And how many people are we up to here? We got, oh boy, we got 60. So we, we have a nice full house <laughs> uh, here. And so what I'm gonna propose in the idea of collaborative learning is that, uh, and peer-to-peer -peer exploration is that, uh, James, why don't we make a bunch of breakout rooms and maybe put like uh, five or six people in each breakout room and they can sort of then uh, help each other because uh, Milan and I are only uh, two people to 60 right now, but that way we can have sort of collaborative experience where people can sort of help each other. And the idea is that um, within your breakout rooms, try to get your spike app up and running, try to uh, load in the code, try to download it onto your onto your hub. Somebody asked, uh, does it need the programs, uh, the, the model build explicitly? You don't, all you need is a motor in A and uh, maybe the distance sensor in port uh, E, I think I put it in. Um, and Milan just posted the uh, right button to take data and left button to run the program. And we'll make some breakout rooms, try to do this for uh, a few minutes, pop back in if you to the main room if you have questions maybe Milan and I will jump around between the breakout rooms and and see how people are doing all right all right how, how did it go thumbs up people doing well did people have success all right excellent you never know right you you send people off another breakout rooms you never know what's going to happen All right, I think. Oh, a couple, couple of minutes coming in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There you yeah. go. All right, so uh, I'll just say a couple, couple comments that I mentioned to a couple people in the in the breakout rooms, right? So uh, in the demo, I showed you doing two data points, sort of this near or far, but of course you could do any any set of data points and and a whole variety of different distances, different motor positions, as well as on lines 21 to 24 ish in the code, you can change the sensor to a, a color sensor to do ambient light or a force sensor to do uh, uh, force. And then tons of uh, computer science extensions to this if you wanted to, instead of just recording one motor, record multiple motors or, uh, or, or further things on top of that. Uh, we're doing motor position. One thing that would be interesting is to sort of think about what is the um, motor speed, right? So now the robot actually reacts in, in different ways. 
on the website. So let me see if I can share my screen here. The web, again, that web link where you got the code. Uh, right below that, I wrote some possible extensions to the activity. Um, so different class classification states that I just sort of said. Um, if you're using the color sensor instead of ambient light, can you do RGB values, which means now each data point has three, which means you're going to have to start to get into more advanced Python. You'll start doing uh, list data structures and, and things like that. Um, uh, K near, nearest neighbor says, don't just tell me the closest value, but find uh, several close values and figure out which one's most common. So uh, K uh, nearest neighbor that we did can sometimes give you inaccurate results if there's one outlier in your data set. If you have a bad training piece of training data, it can throw off your model. But K nearest neighbor sort of smooths that out and will ignore uh, single errors in, in your in your data set. And then uh, the other piece is down here. I, I have uh, I was just thinking in my head other questions you could sort of ask your students. So uh, ways to sort of probe on their understanding or their thoughts about what this means. So when when does it work well? When does it not work well? What happens if you don't enter any training data? So if you just start to try to recognize values without entering training data, or if you enter one data point of training data, what sort of happens? So ways to sort of push on your students' um, understanding of that. And also in the uh, on that website, I have a couple other uh, little examples. This is the um, short, tall classification example that I uh, threw together this weekend with my six-year-old filming. So it's like a, the camera's a little shaky, but uh, measuring the heights of all the stuffed animals in, in the room based on um, uh, doing a nearest neighbor classification. Uh, and we don't want to don't want to play that. But uh, and this was another example that uh, of one of our researchers here put together sort of doing a storytelling uh, example. So I, I again love that idea of sort of art and storytelling and music and dance and combining that with the technology and the coding and sort of bringing all of that together. And this is one using um, the again, the, the color sensor or the, the light sensor detecting uh, ambient light here here in the States, right? We have Puxatani Phil, which on Groundhog Day either shows up or doesn't show up based on if he can see a shadow. So that's a, a little example um, there. All right. So I'll just mention this for completeness, uh, but we will actually not get into the um, uh, K nearest neighbor, uh, uh, sorry, unsupervised learning uh, algorithms, but just so that you have a sense of machine learning. We talked about supervised learning. That's when I know what my data is coming in. We told the robot, this is close, this is far. Now try to recognize close and far. Sometimes though, your data comes in what's called unlabeled. So you just have a bunch of data. You don't know what anything is. The k-means clustering algorithm takes this un this unsupervised, meaning unlabeled data, and learns about it, and actually then produces these uh, this groups of data. Uh oh, my am I frozen? Oh no! No, I'm you're working. Oh, you can hear me. Okay, uh, my computer's freaking out. But anyway. Um, and so it's able to sort of use an algorithm called k-means clustering in order to uh, uh, group that data together. Uh, the way that, uh, again, my computer's not super happy with me right now. <clears throat> All right, hold on one second. Sorry about that. Uh, we can't be lucky enough to have no technology issues, of course. All right. Um, the way that the k-means clustering algorithm works is it's an iterative algorithm where it goes through all the data points. It finds the the centroids of different data. It, it classifies them. It, it finds a new average. It does this uh, a new mean. It, it does this iteratively over and over until it comes up with the clustering. Um, this is a good sort of computer science problem. And so if you are in the computer science realm uh, trying to teach programming with this, this is a good one to use. The, uh, it really reinforces uh, working with data, indexing of lists, of um, doing some simple mathematics like uh, um, finding the mean of, of several data points. In this case, it's two-dimensional space, but it could be in, in uh, um, other dimensions. Uh, and then coming up with the clustering. It's a little tricky with the robot because the data, remember, is unlabeled at the beginning, but then the 
researcher has to go in and label that data to make sense of in in this last step is what does green mean what does red mean what does blue mean and so you'd have to find a way to sort of do that with your robot so it's a little bit trickier with uh robotics but we could certainly explore um different ideas there however what i wanted to do was actually now jump even further ahead to another, the third machine learning concept that we'll talk about, which is called reinforcement learning. So in the previous cases, we had existing data. We trained it based on a data set that we gave it. This is what short means. This is what tall means. And now you can identify what that means in the future. Reinforcement learning happens when you don't have that initial data set, but rather the robot itself goes out and figures it out or the or in a simulation in the real world it would be a robot in a simulation maybe it's just the computers is going out and finding that and what it does is it goes through and it tries a whole bunch of things sees what works sees what doesn't work and over time actually figures out an ideal um, uh, method of of success of of how to actually do something so uh in the in the right scene uh it's let's say you have a simulator and you're able to sort of like navigate different roads you're able to uh go through traffic you're able to uh wait at lights or don't wait at lights whatever it might be and in trying it over and over again in the simulator you learn actually how to do it then in in the real world uh, another example that uh sort of well, well well here's what i'm gonna do is I'm going to give another example using a classic video game. I don't know if you remember uh, Legend of Zelda from way back in the day. I'm actually seeing some nods. Perfect. Good. My students today would not know what the heck I'm talking about. So that's good. That it's good that some people know what I'm talking about. So uh, classic sort of video games are a an area that uh, a lot of reinforcement learning has happened because, of course, in a simulation, you're able to run this over and over again on on the video game but i'm going to use this as an example to give you some of the terminology that we're going to then use and apply to our robots so the first thing is the environment that's the the skate the landscape where i'm in that has a whole bunch of characteristics and uh, bushes and bad guys and good guys and and whatever else it might be and the agent is us that's our robot or that's our main character and the agent is able to uh, perform a number of actions in, in Legend of Zelda, it can go up, down, left or right. And as it goes up, down, left or right, the agent will go through a series of states. And some of those states are boring. It's just a, a desert. Some of those states are a wall where it can't move forward. Some of those states are bad in that there's a bad guy there, or some of them might be good in that you might find a gem, something like that. And so what you can say is for every action that I do, I arrive at a new state and I can evaluate whether that state is good or bad. For instance, if I find the gem, that's a good thing. So I get a reward. So we reward the agent for finding good things. Or if I find a, a bad thing like the bad guy, I get a penalty. And so what the robot's able to do is sort of learn through this. If I, as I navigate through my environment, sometimes I'll get rewarded and sometimes I'll be penalized or, or a negative reward, let's say. The other piece, though, is that every time I move, that also uh, uh, requires some effort. So I should be penalized so that I don't just sort of like uh, uh, move move around to somewhere without any type of goal. And so what you can do is you can have these rewards that have different values. It's very good to find a gem. It's very bad to uh, run into a bad guy. And it's, you know, decently bad. I have to use up a little bit of energy to move around. So I want to try to get to my reward as fast as possible. So I think these are the main terms that I'm going to sort of be referencing the idea of an agent, which will be our robot, the, in, the environment where we're putting it, this idea of states and actions, and then rewards, uh, either positive or negative. So in reinforcement learning, there's two main stages. The first stage is called exploration. This is where the I, I'm going to keep saying robot because that's where we're going, but where we the robot goes out and uh, trains itself. What what do I, am I trying to do? When do I do good things? When do I do bad things? Let me train through this exploration phase. And then it's called exploitation, which is now where I'm going to test the model. So I've developed this model in my head of what works and what doesn't. Now I'm going to follow the rules that I have sort of identified. So in the exploration phase where I'm going out and I'm exploring, there's a collection of episodes. Each trial that I do is called an episode. Each episode will have a series of steps. At each step, I'm going to perform an action determine which state I am and get a reward or a penalty, a negative reward. And then I'm going to just do this over and over again. 
then I repeat it. So I start again, start a new episode. So maybe I went down a bad, dark hallway, scary hallway, and, and it's bad. Or maybe I go and find a rainbow and that's really good. But I'm going to do it over and over again and sort of randomly explore. And over time, I'm going to build up this knowledge about my environment. If I do this, it results in good things. If I do this, it results in bad things. And then once I've done enough exploration, and of course, the question is, how much is enough? And that varies based on the model about the environment, about all these other pieces. But once I've explored enough, now I can go and actually test the model. I can do this exploitation where I say, start at the beginning, choose the best action at every state along the way, and hopefully I will uh, perform the best that I thought possibly can. So that's super high level. I don't know, it probably didn't make sense, but I'm doing my best to sort of just give you the, the brief overview of what reinforcement learning means. What I would like to do now is to actually try and do a reinforcement learning uh, exploration on our robot. So we have a favorite activity here at the center called uh, Silly Walks. So instead of making our robot move with wheels, what we often do is make our robot move without wheels by adding these sort of legs onto it, which is which is a great intro activity. Uh, you can do it just with the heart program of the default program on it. So you don't even need a computer. You just turn it on, make the wheels spin around and the thing flops around and goes silly. And everyone in the class can do a different robot and, and it, it, it's, a, it's a good exploration. But one thing that you find is that these robots never go straight. So they always kind of flop around and they go off kilter, they run into the wall, they go in, in who knows whatever types of directions. So our question or our challenge today is, can I use a reinforcement learning algorithm to train my silly walk robot to become a smart, smart walker? That is, can it go um, perfectly straight? And so what I'm going to propose is that we uh, swap or we extend our robot to not have um, just wheels, but we add some silly legs onto our robot. And so to do this, what I did was I pulled off those pointers that are on either side of the robot and I made these little um, silly legs that can be plugged on. Again, these, these instructions are on the website. You can make your own custom versions, that's totally okay. And then what we're gonna do is use the concepts of reinforcement learning to actually train our robot to go forward. So I introduced a whole bunch of terminology for reinforcement learning, and now I'm gonna make an analogy between that terminology I introduced and our robot. So our agent is the robot, the environment is where it's walking, aka your floor or your table or wherever you are. That's the environment that it's trying to explore. And what we're after is that our robot goes straight. So if you think about the uh, angle of rotation about the uh, middle of your hub, um, the state is how far off axis did it go off center. If I'm going perfectly straight, then I should be rewarded. My robot's doing what we had hoped it should do, and, and I'm going to reward it. As the robot starts to veer off to the left or to the right, those are penalties. So we're basically like scolding our robot every time it goes to the side and rewarding it every time it goes straight. And the hope is by doing this over and over and over again, we can train our robot to go perfectly straight. The actions, remember Zelda went up, down, left, or right. For us, the action is the motor speed. So I have a motor on each side, each side has legs, and I can turn those at different speeds. And the relationship of those two different speeds will affect the sort of direction that I go. So instead of programming my robot explicitly to say, go, go this way at this time or do this speed or whatever it might be, I'm going to use reinforcement learning. I'm gonna put it through a series of episodes where it, it learned, it gets rewarded or penalized based on how it goes. And then from that, it's able to hopefully drive straight. I got a little bit more theory before we get into the into the action of it. So that reinforce, there's a bunch of different types of reinforcement learning algorithms. Again, again, we this is a rabbit hole that we could go forever um, down in, but we're doing the quick two hour version of machine learning. The one we're going to explore is called Q learning. This is called a Q table. It has a whole bunch of Q values in it, which are a whole bunch of at the beginning, a whole bunch of zeros. But the idea is that over time, this table starts to fill with data, and that data is representing um, uh, how desirable a, a particular action is. And what I have over on the left are all the different possible actions of my two motors, aka right in the middle is a medium medium, right? The motors are turning at the same speed. Or you could imagine I'm going slow and fast. 
that now they're going at different speeds one way or different speeds another way. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to randomly pick one of these nine actions over and over again during each step of my episode and then determine did I go straight? Did I go left a little bit? Did I go left a whole bunch? Did I go right a little bit? Did I go right a whole bunch? And based on the uh, direction that I go, I'm going to reward or pen penalize my robot. And so this Q table gets filled in over time throughout the reinforcement learning algorithm until eventually I have identified the sort of idealized way that my robot will uh, hopefully try to go what's called state zero here, try to go straight. What's the best way to sort of do that? So again, if you, I, I, I have all of these slides available so that you can later on digest the code slower, revisit these types of ideas, but I'm assigning a, a reward of plus 10. Every time the robot goes straight, I give it a big reward. If it veers off a little bit to either side, I penalize it a little bit. If it starts to really go crazy, I give it a big negative uh, a reward, a big penalty. And so the exploration is to just run a whole bunch of episodes where it tries a bunch of actions and sees, did I go straight? Did I go left? Did I go right? And keep rewarding itself. Once we've trained it over and over again, then we can actually use that information to um, try to drive straight. All right, so a couple notes before we begin. First up, you wanna make sure your wires are nice and organized because these legs are gonna spin and you don't want them to catch your wires in the legs. If they catch the wires, the motors will get jammed up and the, and the thing won't go that, uh, that smooth. So I'm a big fan of, of nice tight wiring on my uh, robot. So you can see I have no wire sticking out, especially to the sides where it will get caught in the uh, rope, uh, in the, the legs. Second, we got to build the legs. And there's some instructions on the website, but really anything that sort of sticks out and makes this thing flop around will work perfectly fine. So you don't have to follow my instructions specifically, but I have one that has sort of single legs that does a sort of frog motion and another one that has these sort of rotating double legs. And then the third thing is you need a fairly big space to sort of train this thing because it's going to flop around for about five or six seconds each episode. So you're going to run it for an episode, put it back, run it for another episode, put it back, keep resetting it and running it over and over again, uh, hopefully down on the floor if you have a, a big enough table. You want to try to keep it from flipping over, keep it from hitting the walls, because in those instances, it, it will get confused as to which way it's facing. Uh, second, it's not going to seem like it's working at first, but have faith. You might have to train it 10 or 15 times in order to um, sort of get this to work. work. It might get worse because it's exploring randomly before it gets better. It'll eventually start to converge on, on a good solution. And then similarly, you're going to train it with the right button and then eventually test it with the left one. The right button will do our exploration. The left one will do um, the exploitation, the, the uh, actually testing the model like, like we did before. All right. I think that's what I wanted to say about that. Same um, idea here in that uh, if you jump down to this Q learning silly walks piece, I have my robot, the penalties, the rewards, some advice on cable management and building the legs. And then the code is qlearning.llsp, uh, or you can copy and paste the code from uh, the text box into your, uh, into your thing. What you'll do is you'll train it a whole bunch of times. So it will flop around and go in the wrong direction, but it's slowly learning using the uh, gyro to figure out am I going straight and then eventually you'll try to test it and see if it will in fact uh, walk straight that's the goal uh, for the next chunk of time so I'm going to stop sharing I'm going to see if there's any major questions I see the chat sort of blown up a little bit but uh, looks like we're okay Sam I will answer you I, I don't have a um, nearest neighbor for 3d uh, you'll have to play with lists to do that but i can answer that separately all right looks like people are pretty good so james let's put them back into uh some breakout rooms i'll uh are milan you, and i will jump around and uh and try to answer those uh sub questions that you might have well we're waiting for the others to join us did um people have success managed to get it working great Okay. I'm not gonna... Depends how you measure success. I, I trained him a lot and then tested him and 
he may have fallen over once or twice, Ethan, but you know, he seemed oh, to might, might have thrown your data out. Is it yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you do have to be careful that it doesn't bump into walls because then it starts to get misaligned and think that, oh, oh, I can just bump into a wall and go straight or uh, flip over, of course. Um, uh, I'm not accounting for that. I am accounting for if it turns all the way around, like if it's facing 180 degrees, it just stops because it's like, I'm definitely not going in the right direction. And so actually, if you look for that moment in code, you could think about how to also detect this, right? So I'm reading yaw, which is the this rotation, but you could easily read a different type of rotation to get it flipped over and say, I flipped over, do not use this data in, don't use this episode basically, like just restart and try, and try again um, type of thing. Um, excellent. Well, we're almost at the top of the hour, so I just want to say a couple concluding remarks, uh, and then uh, we can wrap it up. All right, that's where we were. Um, but I, I jumped into one group that had actually, uh, in a good way, not followed my building instructions and actually played with different legs on either side of the robot, so short and complex on one side, and, and or long and simple on the other, whatever it was, and even the uh, difference in legs, it was still able to train itself and, and move forward. So that was uh, that was a great exploration there. So uh, congrats on that. All right. Uh, as I said, there's tons of directions to go uh, from here. Um, the first thing is we actually made a little five lesson uh, sequence around artificial intelligence that uh, uses this puppy dog. I purposely did not do it in this workshop so that you would have this as an opportunity to further explore and, and sort of self-direct on your own. So again, doing this near, nearest neighbor, doing a K nearest neighbor, doing the 3D uh, version of it, some reinforcement learning, and then uh, uh, actually getting into some image processing, which is a uh, 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 pretty advanced for for this but uh, a, a direction that you could go so those uh instructions are up on our website we call it robotics playground where we give these sort of placemats of uh different instructions i think i was showing some people whoops um robotics playground here we are uh we have tons of activities here so even if you're teaching primary or and not and doing block based uh, there's tons of activities here that would be of relevance to just using Spike Prime and playing around. There's lots and lots and lots of activities whoops, that we have here. Um, and then some of them are specific to machine learning and AI, if that's the direction that you're sort of uh, looking to go. So definitely encourage you to check out all of those at the Robotics Playground. And then, uh, James, I want to pause here and give you a chance if you uh, want to plug any of the upcoming workshops that MTA is putting on. Uh, look, Ethan, yeah, look, the first thing I'd, I'd like to say is um, you've done an amazing job and uh, <laughs> particularly in light of the complexity of the stuff that you're teaching. So before we finish up, I'd like to say on behalf of the group, a huge thank you to you and uh, also Milan, who, who assists you as well, um, from everybody. I'm sure there was uh, some attendees who were able to take it all in their stride and learn a great deal. And others like myself who also learn a great deal, but their heads are absolutely swimming at the moment and um, spinning from all the information and the concepts that you've laid out for us. Um, and, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of the group when I say we, we really appreciate all the voluntary work you've done preparing this session. And we're yep. really grateful as well for the online, the resources that you've left us with that we can sort of extend our learning from. So um, that's very much appreciated. And um, also before I go, it's... it's um, worth mentioning to the participants that we'll, we'll also be having some additional masterclasses and releasing some videos coming out relating to expanding what you can do and what's possible with Spike Prime. Um, some of it will be using the, the WIO terminal to expand out and add on third party sensors. Um, we've also got the privilege of having Chris Rogers delivering a really exciting masterclass um, workshop where he's combining the Spike Prime with the Raspberry Pi. That's on the 9th of August. So we'll be in touch with more details relating to those initiatives as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I can see we've just about gone over time, but we cannot thank you enough, Ethan, for um, you know for the delivery today. That's it's really awesome. So I'm awesome. Sure well, yeah, thanks. Us. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, joining us on this journey. We're we're still figuring it out as we go. So any any feedback and thoughts and share your projects. We'd love to see what kids do in the classroom. All right. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, everyone.